the greatest of all devotions on this earthly plane of existence is the devotion of the mother to a child. Because it's the devotion of utter and entire sacrifice. And there is no way that mother does not sacrifice something of herself. Because having children is a complete interruption of one's life, as we know it. And it is the mother's life who is the most interrupted. It's like she's forced to grow up. Forced, even if she is not ready. Not, she wants to do something else. Express herself, you know, have more, more of that, of this. And suddenly it's like, None of that. You are placed in a position of care. So it's the greatest form of devotion, therefore. And it's the greatest place in a society. So our culture is very, very... Uh, is in a very precarious place. Because it almost deliberately systematically jeopardizes that role undermines it, belittles that. Women are pushed to reach to the stars and become great achievers because that is the <laughs> promise of, fulfill, of fulfillment. But that's only, only a very, very perverted way of how this so-called liberal democracy that we have exalted as the highest form of social coexistence justifies its political and economical ways of, and not just ways, but indoctrinations. Because the that relationship, that connection, is what reassures the health of the entire society. It reassures the... Well, it reassures pretty much everything. Because everything that we are comes from the mother. Everything that we know, everything that we experience, quality of that experience is given by our mums. Or whoever is being placed into that role. And so this is far from trivial affair. This is also given as an example of the highest devotion on the earthly plane. There's nothing high, nothing more sacred. Never will be. If you will, this is the very meaning of the Madonna con Bambino. The very meaning of, of Madonna. And the highest form of devotion beyond the earthly plane is the devotion to the divine. So this devotion to the divine in a secular culture, and we are by large a secular culture, is not easy because we don't know how, we don't know how to relate to that divine. There is a very beautiful telling moment depicted in the film of a great Russian filmmaker, Andrei Tarkovsky, in his nostalgia. In the early opening scenes of the film, when 
this writer, Russian writer in exile in Italy, in a beautiful Tuscan countryside, uh, stops the car and he is with this very attractive, very beautiful, very charismatic looking translator, interpreter. And she enters the local church where mass being performed, very beautiful. With all this, you know, when they open the effigy of the Mother Mary and all the doves are flying, all the birds, different birds, like flying out of there. The amazing fresco by Fra Angelica. No, not Fra Angelica, Piera della Francesca. And she is a city girl. She's a She's, you know, she's educated. She's, you know, she's here in the countryside. So she's observing it. And of course, she's moved by it. So there's this kind of desire also rising, rises in her willingness to kind of, well, to experience, to feel that. Because she feels, you know, there's this singing, there's this candles, there's this whole incredible, timeless, ambience of an act of devotion. So she's coming to an altar and she wants to kneel, but she doesn't know how. And it's beautifully filmed, beautifully portrayed. She doesn't know how, how you know? It's like she's too stiff in her knees. She finds it impossible. It's very well observed. It's very well observed that sophistication of our age. This, we could even say, the sophistication of that Western culture, which goes everywhere as a um, as a missionary to educate, to what have you, and yet when it wants to take part in something sacred, it doesn't know how. It doesn't have means to, you know, and the means only come from simple, simple weakness in the knees. Weakness in the knees is not the weakness, it's the greatest strength. So the devotion is very, very necessary in this process and I want to now share why because in the five faces of Shiva right in the five five aspects of it all that emission sustenance reabsorption concealment and grace in all five it is only comes through grace that the concealment of our essential nature is reconciled it cannot be done through the effort and personal willpower because if you have been attentive enough you will realize that there is no person there, and therefore it is never personal. So therefore, the best way to, for especially for seasoned sadhakas, for seasoned seekers, if the West doesn't have a more appropriate term, seasoned finders, why am I still you know, why? Why so many years and I still have not been able to realize? Well, this should serve as a helpful reconciliation of this why. Because that in itself is divine. Ignorance is divine. Ignorance is divine. 
origin of ignorance is not personal. You see, it brings humility into this. It kind of gives a righteousness to that sense of self, of that ego, that, you know, I am not this, you know, this, this and that. It gives also a place for a, some form of personal contempt. I'm either not worthy, or I'm not disciplined enough, or I'm not good enough. I cannot do it, basically, you see? But you see the dynamics inside. Do you sense the dynamics? All this is only used to reinforce. I'm this, I'm that, you know? Whereas a, a simple, simple, tentative understanding that never was it a personal affair. It's all down to one and the only. This is what surrender truly means. So therefore, all this is like trying to headbutt heaven. It's of no use. Because there's no, there are no doors to butt at. In heaven, no doors. Maybe some kind of structure that resembles an open portal, I don't know. Certainly free to walk in. Always. So, the anugraha, that grace, the grace revealing power, is linked directly to the power of devotion. The quality of devotion is important because it is this quality that welcomes, brings grace. This is where that subtle movement, very, very refined movement, sincere, innocent movement, is what releases the grip of concealment and grace generously pours itself down. That's what it is. And that highest form of devotion for divine here is of course emulated in myriad of ways of how that devotion can be expressed. All goes into culturing that. All goes into culturing that. Therefore, if someone feels that one can, forgive me, jump on the bandwagon of that new Advaitic and who is worshipping whom or who is devoted to whom, sort of resolving that predicament at an intellectual level. It could be at the expense of give, be given to dryness of non-dual realization, which also dry one's whole being out of any juices. It's dry and, frankly, boring. So, this is why I brought examples in the earlier days, when we first sat together, that even completely and utterly enlightened sages and Sibyls always worship their God. You see? In whichever way. It may be when there's revelation of this structure is so profound, you begin to worship yourself. You see yourself not in, in no other way other than divine manifestation. And of course, to the uninitiated, to the one who is not aware of what's going on, it may be, seem like an act of 
adultery, an act of no. narcissism. We spoke about this as well, the myth of narcissists completely being perverted in our culture, turned into a negative example, where in fact the myth is much more complex, much more complex. It's this Sigmund Freudian interpretation that we now adopted, you know. Each time I take a knife to eat, must be a dick. You know. Sorry, Sigmund. You know. I collect knives. What does it mean? I'm in trouble? I always loved knives since I was a kid. It's in my culture. Little boys, we all had knives. And as we grew up, knives got bigger, more beautiful, more refined. Sharp. I need psychology, I need help. So, you see this... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, devotion, therefore. When I came back to England from Uzbekistan, where at the age of 36, I went through this transformation, this profound transformation of consciousness. I got back and in the TM center, I got in touch, of course, with people whom I knew, whom I've met some five years prior to that. And I was speaking to this man from Scalmsdale. There's a center in the UK. And of course, there's kind of like a, somehow the, the news of this was passed around, you know. And he was just, oh, wow, you know, like, How did it happen? You know, like what what did you do? What happened? How? I said, I have no idea. I didn't do anything. And he pressed, he still was like, but something, you know, you must at least you have some maybe insight, you know, intuition. And I said, it's all Maharishi's grace and the love that I have simply received. And this love was enough. This felt like all there is. And he met Maharishi and I didn't. And he was silent and he said, you should come and talk about this. You should come and talk about this. And of course, it never happened because of the policies of the movements. It's not natural, it's normal, you know. Every movement has to insulate itself from rascals like myself. It goes without saying, you know. Because movements are movements. But in many interviews and in many kind of like you know, there's like, even at some point, I remember after that particular interview, they even gave this analogy, spiritual athlete. They referred to me as a spiritual athlete. I remember on their blog, you know, because of somehow it come across as there is like this and that, you know, so much discipline, focus, so much, you know, but that wasn't really the decisive factors. I could say that, that these were not the decisive factors. It's not because of being driven, but because there were certain points where I have realized how utterly and entirely helpless I am and how 
because of that helplessness, it immediately opens the door to that what is almighty. Whether it was the most difficult time in my young years in London when I was going through so much and no certainty whatsoever, neither certainty in relationships because I was going through a separation then, nowhere to live, no certainty in career, anything. I was staying in that apartment that old lady was dying in the hospital. It stung of nicotine because it penetrated, I think, a few centimeters into the walls. I tried to wash it and the nicotine will come to the surface. You know? I took a sponge and I started, I thought I'm going to wash off some of this. More brown comes out. So I left it. But it was a beautiful place, you know, and it like these French doors into the beautiful garden. So I always slept with doors open, no matter what temperature was, because obviously to breathe fresh air. And one particular very, very, very intense kind of like feeling, feeling it all, feeling a whole weight of the world. Um, I fell asleep at the sound of rain. And the body just woke up in the middle of the night. And I just sat. And I this, whether it was moonlight or not, but I just sensed this and the sound of rain. And I just realized how everything is okay. Everything is profoundly, beautifully, harmoniously sits together. All this emotional intensity, all this what felt like calamity, and the calamity was not just what I was going, there was also like, you know, daughter in Poland growing up without me, you know, all that, it's just way too much. And all this is just washed off by the rain. And I'm sitting there in this complete state of surrender and amazement at the serenity, translucency, and beauty of it all. And just flicker of a thought of wonder. Why? Why is the calamity? What is the big deal? It's not, not important. None of this. It's all in the mind. What a relief. And of course, you know, it's like emotional outpouring there, emotional outpouring and what a relief and lulled myself back into sleep and I woke up and I walked on the street and tall again, you know. It doesn't matter. I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. It doesn't matter, you know. Today is now. Is it, This is it. Of course, <laughs> by some kind of like a magic wand, things just started to open up. It's like, from nowhere to live, I'm living in the house of the greatest art critic at the time, with my old whole wing, with antique furniture from Christie's and you know, Chinese porcelain, you know, creative people, my neighbors, with the house where old Nuriyev lived right across. <laughs> it's just in Chelsea Gardens. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. The whole predicament is ridiculous. And of course, my daughter is grow up and there's this reconciliation and everything. And the one from whom I'm breaking up is still one of my best friends. All this is just, all this is just thought goes into some kind of merry-go-round and you know, get caught in catch-22. This is just one of those so-called, whatever you call them, sudden illuminations. And there were plenty of those. But in all those that I'm just um, happily sharing was one distinctive feature. One distinctive, distinctive feature. Surrender. Because it always was nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do about it. 
I cannot push it. All I could do now is to let it be. Let it be. And the extraordinary things rise from that let it be. So in that so-called moment of grand awakening, in that profound transformation of consciousness, which is nothing to do with Satori, nothing to do with the... It was the end of how I knew myself, the end of the world, the end of it all. It wasn't because I somehow pushed that door wide open. It's because there was this final moment of surrender. Take me. Just please take me. I'm, I, I'm done. I'm done with myself. You know, I cannot do this anymore. You know, but take me. So, later, of course, I, later, this is why I'm speaking that, so it's not just sounds like a, some soap opera. Later, I learned why it is so powerful. Because there is a connection to that anugraha. Devotion brings anugraha. Devotion brings grace. Grace and devotion, in fact, are kind of synonymous. They are synonymous. Devotion invokes that, it brings this. But it's not easy because it's not given in our culture. So therefore, each and every one of us find our own ways. We are destined to find our own ways. Recreate our own ways. Because it's not easy to... It's easier to follow or go with the stream if there is a collectively shared stream. Safe travels. Safe travels. But if there is not collectively shared streams, Sometimes we have to stream against the current. Sometimes we have to find our own way. Therefore, sovereignty is required for that. Independence is required. Tremendous power of the heart is required to be able to stream against the current. As that forel, any other noble fish that goes up the stream for nesting. 